Good morning. First of all, welcome to our humdrum, plain, ordinary church. It all came down this week. It, 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 in just five minutes, it'll go back up. The next 11 months will go fast, I'm sure. And secondly, thank you. Thank you for being here. Uh, those of you watching at home, this is January the 14th. That can't, we're halfway through January already. Anyway, we had a whiteout about 20 minutes, half an hour ago, but these brave people braved that and they're here. Thank you for being here. And let's open with a word of prayer. Dear Lord, we do thank you that for the safety of those here today, Lord, and for those who are planning to come to our next service, keep them safe as well. Thank you for the snow, which reminds us of the, how, how white our hearts can be when you wash our sins away through the blood of your son. We are so grateful for that truth to give us everlasting life. And Lord, just be with us, be with those on the roads and those uh, uh, tending to others this morning. May they just be safe and warm and, and Lord, keep them, keep them under your watchful eye. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. The first song is number 87, Leaning on the Everlasting Arms, number 87. What a fellowship, what a joy divine, Leaning on the everlasting arms. What a blessedness, what a peace is mine, Leaning on the everlasting arms, Leaning, leaning, Safe and secure from all alarms, Leaning, leaning, Leaning on the everlasting arms. Oh, how sweet to walk in this pilgrim way, Leaning on the everlasting arms. Oh, how bright the path grows from day to day, Leaning on the everlasting arms. Leaning, leaning, Safe and secure from all alarms. Leaning, leaning, Leaning on the everlasting arms. What have I to dread? What have I to fear? Leaning on the everlasting arms. I have blessed peace with my Lord so near. Leaning on the everlasting arms. Leaning, leaning. Safe and secure from all alarms. Leaning, leaning, leaning on the everlasting arms. And amen. Our unison reading comes to us from Exodus chapter 7, verses 10 through 13. Please stand if you're able and comfortable. Unless your pew is so warm you don't want to lose that warmth, stand up. I'm going to invite Mrs. Dawn Evans to the pulpit to lead us in this reading. And Moses and Aaron went in unto Pharaoh, and they did so as the Lord had commanded. And Aaron cast down his rod before Pharaoh and before his servants, and it became a serpent. Then Pharaoh also called the wise men, and the sorcerers, now the magicians of Egypt. They also did in like manner with their enchantments, for they cast down every man his rod, and they became serpents. But Aaron's rod swallowed up their rods, and he hardened Pharaoh's heart, that he hearkened unto them as the Lord had said. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading of his word, and you may be seated. When we left off last week, the Egyptians are slave masters over the Israelites. 
God sends Moses along with his brother Aaron to meet with the king of Egypt, otherwise known as the Pharaoh. With the full backing and urging and happy support of the Israelites, Moses and Aaron go to the Pharaoh and they make a simple request. They ask the Pharaoh to allow the Israelites three days freedom so they can go into the wilderness to worship and make sacrifices to the true God Jehovah. While the Pharaoh feels he owes the Israelites nothing, and he certainly owes their God nothing, request denied, Moses and Aaron then promise that if the Pharaoh doesn't allow the Israelites to have their feast, then both pestilence and death will fall upon them all. Well, the Pharaoh sees this as a threat, not a promise, and he, he gets angry, and re, in response to the Pharaoh, in response, the Pharaoh decides to turn the Israelites against Moses and Aaron. The Pharaoh increases the workload of the Hebrew slaves. The slaves will now have to scavenge for straw for, to build their bricks instead of having the materials, the materials supplied to them by their Egyptian overseers. And even though the Pharaoh adds this task of providing their own materials, he does not lighten their quota. He expects the same amount of bricks, the same quality of bricks made daily as before. But because of this added duty, as you can imagine, the slaves fail to produce the same quality and the same quantity of bricks as required of them. They are beaten all the more. The people cry out. They blame Moses for their plight. Moses, their hero, becomes their villain. To them, Moses should have stayed in Midian and minded his own business. When Moses interfered, things got worse for them, and the children of Israel confront Moses and Aaron, blaming them for their situation. You know, this reminds me of some counseling I've done in the past. You know, when you have an abusive parent, you often don't blame the abusive parent, you blame the good parent, because they don't, they don't stop the abusive parent. You know, your anger, your disappointment, your discouragement, it's misplaced. You know, they should be mad at the Pharaoh, but no, they're mad at Moses, who's trying to do them this favor. Moses is bewildered by all this. He prays to God. Moses questions why the Lord has failed him. Moses feels the Lord has not been with him as he had promised he would be. God answers back, reminding Moses that he had established a covenant with his forefathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And he promised that he will give them the land of Canaan. And this is a slight bump in the road, part of his plan to get the Israelites to the promised land. You know, God has not forgotten his people. He never does. He hears their groanings as they suffer in bondage. God promises through Moses to stretch forth his hand and deliver his children from the Pharaoh. So Moses speaks to the people, but they will not hearken his words. Their anguish of spirit and cruel and mistreatment, uh, they must now endure clouds their minds and their judgment. In short, they hate Moses. They're hating the wrong person. Anyway, God then tells Moses to go back and tell Pharaoh to let his people go. Moses hesitates. He figures, well, if my own people, the Hebrews, the Israelites, won't listen to me, what chance do I have against, what success will I have against the Pharaoh? The Lord tells Moses that he is going to allow Aaron to speak for the, uh, to the Pharaoh on Moses' behalf. Moses is to relay to Aaron everything God tells him, and then Aaron will deliver this message to the Pharaoh that he is to allow the Hebrews to leave Egypt. I know this seems cumbersome, but you just have to get used to it. We see this for the next several chapters. This arrangement that God talks to Moses, Moses talks to Aaron, and Aaron talks to everyone else. But that's the arrangement they've made. Aaron is to be Moses' spokesperson. But you see, their task gets all the more difficult. As if the Pharaoh is not stubborn enough, God promises to harden that Pharaoh's heart so that he will not listen to reason. We may ask why. I don't know. You know it's, he's, I guess because he's trying to just display, maybe it's not about the Pharaoh, maybe it's about the Israelites. He wants to display his mighty power and his punishment and his anger against the Pharaoh. And if the Pharaoh is agreeable, then that won't happen. I think he's trying to prove something to the Israelites, but your guess is as good as mine. God purposely hardens the Pharaoh's heart. The Pharaoh won't, won't listen to... Uh, even listen when God will bring terrible plagues upon Egypt, but I'm getting ahead of myself on that. So Moses and Aaron, once again, they just walk up to the Pharaoh. I always get tickled by that. You, you just could not walk up to President Biden. 
You could not just walk into the Kremlin. You just couldn't walk into the Taj Mahal or any place where there's any sort of authority. But they somehow, these two schmoes, just somehow go up to the Pharaoh and they have face-to-face -face time with him. I suppose that in itself is a minor miracle. God decides it's time for Moses to give some proof to his almighty power. So God tells Moses to tell Aaron to throw his rod, his walking stick, his staff, whatever you want to call it, to throw his rod down upon the floor in front of the Pharaoh. And the rod turns into a serpent, you know, a snake. <coughs> Excuse me. Unimpressed, the Pharaoh summons his royal magicians to throw Moses' attempt of intimidation back in Moses' face. The magicians, too, throw their rods on the floor and their rods, too, become serpents. Looks like they, we have a standoff. Everybody's sticks are serpents. Everyone has snakes on the floor. Moses is not displayed any more prowess than the king's men. But then in a turn of events, Aaron's serpent, Aaron's rod, eats the magician's serpents, proving that the Lord God, Jehovah, has the upper hand and the last laugh. Unfortunately, the Pharaoh uh, decides to ignore this obvious sign of things to come. The king behaves just as the Lord said he would. He stubbornly refuses to listen to reason. So God determines to send ten plagues upon the Pharaoh and the Egyptian nation. Now for the sake of time, I will be relaying just the first nine plagues this morning. I'll be doing so very quickly. I'm going to save the tenth plague, the final plague, for next week. But please keep in mind that as I speedily go through these first nine of ten plagues, they're found in four nice-sized chapters of our Bible in the Old Testament, Exodus 7 through 10. If you have time this week, read that on your own. Some scholars say that these nine plagues cover a period of a few weeks. Some say 40 days. Some say this, all these plagues took over a year. I don't know. No one knows for sure. But I don't want my going through these quickly to give you a sense of the, the, the timing on this was as quick as I'm talking anyway. Let's go to plague number one. The Lord tells Moses to tell Aaron to take the rod that changed into a snake, it's now a rod again, and go to the riverside. God then commands Moses to tell Aaron to tell the Pharaoh that the God of the Hebrews orders him to release his people. Moses instructs Aaron to strike the waters with the rod and all the waters turn to blood. All the fish in the waters die and the river stinks as we can all quite imagine. The Egyptians are unable to, to drink this water. I mean, if the fish are dying in it, yet it's certainly not drinkable for human consumption. Moses then commands Aaron to hold his stick over the water. Just then every drop of water in Egypt turns to blood, including the water in the rivers, the canals, the ponds, even water kept in jars and buckets turns to blood. The king still stubbornly refuses to listen. He returns to his palace and he never gives, doing what God wants him to do, a second thought. This plague lasts for seven days. Well, the Egyptians can't survive without water for seven days, so they have to dig new ditches and new trenches and, and new wells just to have water to drink. Plague number two. After this happens, God tells Moses that if the Pharaoh does not allow his people to go, God will cover Egypt with frogs. That sounds like a happy thing. It would not be a happy thing. With a hard heart, the Pharaoh will not listen. Moses tells Pharaoh to hold his rod over the waters and frogs come from the ponds and the rivers. They invade the royal ovens, the beds, their bowls, they're everywhere. Frogs are everywhere, but then the king's magicians use their magic, their enchantments to do the same trick. And by the way, I don't know how... The, the, these king's men, these magicians, obviously aren't from God. So either this is a, some sort of magic David, David Copperfield, Doug Henning kind of trick, or they're using Satan's power. Either way, they're not using God's power. I just wanted to point that out. So these, uh, these uh, king's magicians do the same thing. They create frogs out of the waters. But having enough of the frogs, the Pharaoh sends for uh, Moses and Aaron and tells them that if their Lord could make these frogs disappear and stop bothering Egypt, he will allow the Israelites to go to their feast and to make sacrifices in the wilderness. Well, Moses isn't done. Moses instructs the Pharaoh to choose the day. Well, what day are you going to release us? Is it going to be Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, next week? You tell me the day, and that's the day the frogs will leave. The Pharaoh promises, okay, tomorrow, the next day, I will release the Israelites. 
After Moses and Aaron leave the palace, Moses prays that the Lord removes the frogs that he had sent as punishment to the king. The Lord answers Moses' prayer, but not quite. He doesn't remove the frogs. All the frogs die. In other words, the frogs... Thank you. Thank you. Brand new car. Croak is the right answer. The frogs croak. The dead frogs are placed in piles, and the whole country begins to stink all over again. But when the king sees that things are now better, he reneges on his promise. He does not let the people go. Plague number three. The Lord then has Moses to tell Aaron to hit the ground with his rod, and everywhere in Egypt, the dust turns into lice. This is the one that just gives me the creeps. Just lice. And the lice are crawling on all the people and all the animals. But when the magicians this time try to, uh, to, to, to uh, duplicate this, their powers fail them. They cannot do this. The magicians tell Pharaoh, God has done this. We have no power. We cannot duplicate this. But the Pharaoh is too stubborn to listen. Let's move on to plague number four. The Lord tells Moses to go to the Pharaoh and demand that he let the Israelites go one more time. The Pharaoh refuses, so swarms of flies attack every official and every citizen of Egypt. Houses are full of flies and the ground crawls with them. However, the Lord's people in Goshen will not be bothered by the flies. If you remember, generations before this, Joseph, when he brings his family, they don't move into Egypt proper. They move into the land of Goshen because, so they could practice you know, worshiping their own God and not be influenced by the, uh, by the Egyptian false gods. Well, apparently God had a plan for this because the people in Goshen aren't living. The, the Israelites are living in the land of Goshen and they're not living among the Israelites. So the frogs don't bother them. Somehow God is protecting the Israelites from these plagues. As predicted, the Pharaoh refuses to listen and Egypt is tormented by flies. The Pharaoh then gives Moses permission for the Israelites to leave Egypt and to, to make sacrifices to their God. But then as soon as the plague is removed, the Pharaoh will change his mind and prevents the Israelites from leaving. Plague number five. Oh, we're not done. We have several more. There are more plagues to come. Plague number five. All the Egyptian livestock drops dead. Just drops dead. Now the Israelites, the few livestock they have, they're still alive. But even though this happens, the king will not let the people go. Plague number six. After this happens, boils break out on all the Egyptians' skin. The boils are so bad, the magicians can't even come when the Pharaoh summons them. The Pharaoh tells the Hebrews to go, but as soon as the boils go away, the Pharaoh changes his mind. Plague number seven. Thunder and hailstones are next. The storm destroys much of their crops, their homes, and their animals, the few animals they have left. And this storm, the, the, these hailstones are apparently fire and ice coming down. I mean, it's just the worst natural disaster they've ever seen. The king momentarily says he's going to release the Jews, but when the storm stops, he reneges. Plague number eight. As if the previous plagues of flies and lice weren't enough, God sends locusts. It seems like each time the insects get bigger, right? They eat everything, everything that's left, any fruit on the tree. They leave nothing behind for the, uh, no crops or, or, or plants for the uh, Egyptians to eat. The Pharaoh is agreeable to Moses' request to allow the people to go. But when the locusts leave, he changes his mind. This brings us to the final plague today, plague number nine of ten. This ninth plague is darkness. And I'm talking darkness. Now, I know you all know where you are, where you're sitting. But do you think you could find your way home? You couldn't drive in this, in darkness. Do you think you could find your way home from here? I mean, uh, let, let's equate this. With, I can't imagine what it's like to be blind. You know, my eyes aren't what they used to be, but I still can see. And if, we, if you wake up and you can see, even if, with glasses or contacts, you need to be thankful. I just can't imagine. But th th I've, I've met some blind people who can do wondrous things, even though they've never had sight. That being said, the ninth plague is darkness. God, Jehovah, blots out the sun on the Egyptians. It is so dark, no candle or lamp can countermand the darkness. Yet the Hebrews living by nearby in the land of Goshen, they have light. How is this possible? Well, with God, all things are possible. All through these first nine plagues, the Israelites seem to be protected. Somehow the Hebrews have light while the Egyptians live in darkness. 
I just mentioned the nine plagues very quickly. But during the torment of most of these, the Pharaoh is agreeable to allow the Hebrews to leave. Then after each plague ceases, so does the, the uh, Pharaoh's agreeableness, his kindness. And his heart is hardened to renege on his promises. You know, in my book, nine plagues are nine too many. One would have, just the lice one would have, and I, I would do it. I, in fact, I'll leave Egypt with you <laughs> if you send lice. Nine plagues are nine too many. Unfortunately, the Pharaoh's heart is so hard that nine aren't enough. God sends a tenth final plague. Come back next week and we'll talk about God's tenth plague upon Egypt. Page number 101. The Haven of Rest. Number 101 in your hymnals. The Haven of Rest. Thy soul in sad exile was out on life's sea, so burdened with sin and distress, till I heard a sweet voice saying, Make me your choice, and I entered the haven of rest. I anchored my soul in the haven of rest, I'll sail the white sees no more. The tempest may sweep or the wild stormy deep. In Jesus I'm safe evermore. I yielded myself to his tender embrace and faith taking hold of the word. My fetters fell off and I anchored my soul, the haven of rest is my Lord. I've anchored my soul in the haven of rest, I'll sail the white seas no more. The tempest may sweep or the wild stormy deep, in Jesus I'm safe evermore. The song of my soul, since the Lord made me whole, has been the old story so blessed. Of Jesus who saved, whosoever will have a home in the haven of rest. I've anchored my soul in the haven of rest. I'll sail the white seas no more. The tempest may sweep or the wild stormy deep. In Jesus I'm safe evermore. Our responsive reading today comes from James chapter 4 verses 13 through 15. The door just blew open and that door just shut. That was wild. Our responsive reading today comes from James chapter 4, verses 13 through 15. Please stand if you're able and comfortable to stand. I'm going to invite Brother Brian Evans to the pulpit to lead us in this reading. Go to now, ye that say, Today or tomorrow we will go into such a sea, and continue there a year, and buy and sell and get gain. Whereas ye know not what shall be on the morrow. For what is your life? It is even a vapor. That appeareth for a little time, and then vanisheth away. For that ye ought to say, if the Lord will, We shall live and do this or that. Amen. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading of his word, and you may be seen. There are some mighty fine definitions in the Bible. In fact, the Bible is full of wise definitions. Of course, everything in God's word is wise. I can't deny that. But in the Bible, some mere mortal men offer up some really good, solid definition of some terms. Of course, they do so in the, with the, through the inspiration of God. But I would trust the Bible's definition of terms, even that over of Mr. Webster. For instance, King David very often defines the Lord as his mighty rock. 
Today, if I call one of you a rock, you might take it as an insult, thinking that I'm implying that you're stubborn or heavy or thick-headed. But King David calling the Lord a mighty rock is not an insult at all. In fact, it's a very wise comparison. After all, rocks are huge and they're bigger than us. A rock is not formed by men. Rocks are sturdy. We can be protected against our enemies by hiding in the cleft of the rock. A mighty rock is immovable. King David uses great wisdom in this comparison. I thank you, King David. Let me give you another example. His son, King Solomon, very wisely defines what a fool is. According to Solomon, a fool is anyone who hates understanding, correction, or knowledge. A fool is anyone who thinks they can sidestep God's plan. Simply put, if we despise the wisdom of God, we are fools. That's genius. Thank you, King Solomon. But this is just my opinion, but I think of all the definitions and comparisons in the Bible, the wisest of them comes from the book of James. James defines life. More specifically, James defines your life and my life. James asks his readers, for what is your life? And that's a very good question, a question that's been, that has evaded scholars and a question that has caused debates for centuries. So what is life? Well, born in 384 BC, philosopher Aristotle said that the meaning of life is to achieve happiness and virtue. And those are two mighty fine goals, I must say, and not a bad definition, but James' definition is better. 17th century French philosopher René Descartes uh, defined his life by saying, I think, therefore I am. That's a very wise definition, but not as wise as James. 19th century American philosopher Henry David Thoreau feared that when he would come to die, he would discover that he had not lived. Perhaps unknowingly, Thoreau defined his life as a fear of death. That's an admirable uh, description, but James's definition is better. James does not leave his readers hanging as I have led you, as I have left you hanging today. He quickly answers the question. He says, life is even a vapor that appeareth for a little time and then poof, vanisheth away. James says that life is a vapor. Now, our King James Bible puts a U in vapor, but don't be, let that confuse you. We're talking about the same thing with or without the U. Vapor is like steam. It's like smoke from a snuffed out candle. It's just there and then it's not. Let's think about that, ladies and gentlemen. Vapor is a haze. It's a mist. It's ever changing. It's there one second and gone the next. And just like life, once a vapor is gone, it can never be recaptured. That's genius. That's absolute genius. This is a brilliant definition. A vapor sums up our lives perfectly. Let's not skim over this definition. This comparison is very deep and it deserves our attention, so let's pay attention. This might very well change, this definition may very well change our attitudes about everything. By comparing life to a vapor, James shows us, shows us that life is both precious and common simultaneously. That blows my mind. Life is both precious and common. Wow. But we ask, how could that be? Aren't precious and common uh, opposite descriptions? Well, yes, they are. Well, when thinking of life as mere vapor, we can't help but get a sense of urgency, a sense of, of, of uh, even unrest. If life is but a vapor, then we don't have much time, do we? Life is temporary. It is here and then it isn't. There's not even a minute to spare. We have so much to do with the few moments we're allotted. This means life is very precious. But... When comparing life to a vapor, we also get a sense of peace and calmness. If life is just merely a vapor, then why, bothering, why bother getting ourselves so, uh, so worked up and upset? Life quickly passes and soon it amounts to nothing. All this, all this that we think is so important, all this that we suffer through will quickly pass. In the end, all the things that upset us, all the things that worry us, all the things we value here on this earth won't matter. Life is common. Life is a vapor. It is both precious and common. James is saying that life is a big deal, and yet it's not such a big deal. Just like vapor. Genius. I think it is a wise person who can balance both outlooks. Life is short, so we must make the most of the little time we have. 
Either every moment should be cherished and there is not a moment to lose. Grab all we can. Yet, but since life is short, why allow ourselves to be so troubled by all that comes with it? It passes far too quickly for us to be bothered by insignificant things. As they say today, let's not sweat the small stuff and we need to pick and choose our battles. We may well think, well, this James, oh, he's a genius. How wise it is of him to give such a deep, compelling answer. He sums up both the complexities and the simplicities of life with one statement, life is a vapor. Well, not to take anything away from James, I'm sure he was very smart, but he no doubt learned this wise philosophy from the best teacher who ever lived. You see, James had a very wise brother who may, may have taught him a great deal. James' brother is a man named Jesus. Yes, that Jesus. Both Matthew 13 and Mark 6 tells us that Jesus is indeed one, I mean, sorry, that James is indeed one of Jesus Christ's brothers. I know what you're thinking. If James is a, is, I'll get it right yet. If Jesus is a son of God, how is it possible that James is Jesus' brother? Well, it's not really relevant to this sermon, but I will give you three theories about this. The first is that Jesus and James are actually cousins, but the, but the Bible calls them brothers. Sometimes in the Bible, especially in the Old Testament, people are not described by their 21st century family definitions. Grandfathers are sometimes called fathers and nephews are called brothers. So we could chalk this up to a bit of family Bible mislabeling. The second theory is that Mary's husband, Joseph, was a widower before he marries Mary. It could be that Joseph had fathered children to his previous wife before taking on the role of Jesus' earthly father, but there really is no biblical evidence to support this theory. And the third explanation, and the one which I believe, is that after the Virgin Mary gives birth to Jesus, she and Joseph take on the traditional roles of husband and wife, and they have additional children. This explanation actually has biblical support. The book of Matthew tells us that Joseph knew not his wife until she had given birth to Jesus. In other words, they until she, eventually after the whole Christmas story, they were intimate. Well, when a husband knows a wife in this, in the biblical sense, lots of time, children are realized in that knowing. And one of those children most likely was this fellow James. But no matter how you wish to explain their relationship, the Bible says that James and Jesus were brothers. And as Jesus' brother, James sees firsthand that Jesus' life is a vapor. And in that vapor, Jesus finds the balance of having both a calmness and an urgency regarding his own life and his own death. James, after the fact, of course, learns and understands that brother Jesus was born to die. Jesus, knowing that his earthly life would be short and that, his heavenly, and that a heavenly life awaits him, for the most part has a calmness about his own death, as he willingly and quietly lays down his own life to pay for the sins of this world and to make a pathway for us to have eternal life in heaven. Yet, Jesus, knowing that he does not have long on this earth, fills his precious time by constantly traveling, going from place to place and preaching, telling all who will listen that they too can have eternal life in the kingdom of God. He busies himself telling others about an eternal life after this temporary earthly one. And he does not stop preaching this until the very end. Aware that his own death is quickly approaching, Jesus leaves his disciples this soothing advice. He says, let not your hearts be troubled. In other words, Jesus tells his men not to allow themselves to get too bothered by his physical death. As brutal as it is about to be, Jesus' death just comes and goes. He wants his disciples to be more concerned about the next life that Jesus is making possible by dying. So he tells his disciples, let not your hearts be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself that where I am, there ye may be also. Just like a vapor, Jesus knows his life will soon pass. But that is not to say that his life is not precious. In fact, when Judas realizes 
the gravity of his actions in betraying Jesus, he tries to return the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and to the elders. And he says, I have sinned that I have betrayed the innocent blood. Judas realizes that Jesus' life is precious. Every Christian should know how precious Jesus' life was. And it was far more... It was worth far more than just 30 pieces of lousy silver. Jesus in return had said of Judas that it would have been better that he had never been born. Wow, Jesus' life is precious. And his life is made all the more precious because it is an, it's an innocent life, void of any sin. His death comes about because of the purposeful shedding of his innocent blood. And there is no greater sin and there is no greater sacrifice on this earth than the purposeful shedding of innocent blood. That sums up the life of Christ. How about ours? Are we wasting our lives on things that are just not that important? I mean, if it doesn't matter in five years, does it matter today? The biggest waste of our life is concentrating on the pleasures of this world ahead or in place of the promises of eternal life. Our lives are short and they're precious. Life is not a booby prize. Life is the brass ring. And I can think of no better way of acknowledging its value and its brevity than by accepting Jesus Christ as our Savior today, this moment, this moment in time. If you've not already accepted Jesus, please do. Jesus Christ understood what his little half-brother James was saying. In fact, it was Jesus, Jesus Christ who's part of the triune God who inspired James to describe life as a vapor. If someone here today has not given their lives to Christ, their precious lives, as precious and as, as these lives are, they are short. But there's another life waiting for us. If you've not given your life to Christ today, please do so with wisdom and urgency. As the response of reading tells us, we are not guaranteed a tomorrow. At the beginning of this sermon, I relayed King David's definition of as God as a rock. I also relayed King Solomon's definition of a fool as anyone who tries to sidestep God's wisdom. As Jesus tells us in his parable, let's build our short, precious lives on the rock. Let's not be like a fool who builds his life on the unwise sands of this world. So when the storms of life come our way, we will be anchored in the Lord and not in this world. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I do thank you for these wonderful words of James. We so should take them to heart, Lord. We are not guaranteed tomorrow. Life is but a vapor. It comes and goes, but it's so precious. May we all in this room, under the sound of my voice, have given or will at this moment give our lives to Jesus Christ. May we accept your Son as our Savior so our sins can be forgiven, so we can not just have a precious life now we can have one in heaven in your kingdom. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Song, song number 56 to, to close. Please stand if you're able. Number 56, God will take care of you. We'll just sing the first verse. Be not dismayed, whatever be time, God will take care of you. Beneath his wings of love abide, God will take care of you. God will take care of you through every day, all of the way. He will take care of you. God will take care of you. And he will. Brother Mike, if you come at this time and close our service with prayer. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for the opportunity to come into your house, Lord. We just give you thanks for the message that was received today and just help us take it into our hearts and Consider it and ponder it through the week and just apply it to our lives. Lord, we ask your hand of care and blessing upon all on our prayer list, whether spoken aloud or held within our hearts. Just be with them and let them feel your presence in their lives. Lord, we just ask that you be with each and every one of us as we leave and just help us to do your will and keep us safe through this coming week. We pray all this through Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen.
Amen. Thank you for coming. You're dismissed.